get to see everyone's beautiful faces, and then we can start. Um, but I hope everyone's having a good night so far. Thanks for joining us. It's 8 p.m. I know it's a bit late, a bit after dinner for some of you, but we're all happy to have you here. My you, by the way, Mohammed is also sitting here <laughs> <laughs> as my support. <laughs> I was going right. to ask. So, <laughs> hello, Mohammed. <laughs> Where am I, you? On that note, Mohammed yeah. is your great fan. Remember that. <laughs> All right, well, good evening, everyone. And um, it's nice to see that we're here with friends and good company over dinner, or maybe a glass of wine. It's a good night for that. But hey, everyone, my name's Isa, and I'm a bookseller at Paul Dixon Pro's Bookstore. And I'd like to welcome all of you to PNP Live. A thank you for joining us in this virtual format in the midst of these extraordinary times, throughout all of which we strive to continue to bring you the authors that you love and their work to the Paul Dixon Pro's community. We have a special program for you tonight as we are presenting this in partnership with the Washington Literacy Center. If at any point during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase the author's book, Tastemakers, on the Politics and Prose website. And additionally, you can ask our guests a question by clicking on the Q&A, which can be found near the bottom of your screen. And while we will try to get to everyone's questions, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address yours. Finally, we want to thank you for being here with us tonight. We're so thankful to our family of loyal customers and new friends for keeping our business and our spirits afloat. And it is now my pleasure to introduce tonight's amazing guests. So we have with us Mayuk Sen. He is a James Beard Award and International Association of Culinary Professionals award-winning writer. He's currently based in New York City. His food writing has also been featured in the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, and has been anthologized in the best American food writing books that were released in 2019 and in 2021. Currently, he teaches food journalism at New York University. We will also be joined by the guru of Persian cooking and Iranian culture and ceremonies, Najmia Batmanglish, Bat who has spent the past 40 years cooking, traveling, and adapting authentic Persian recipes to tastes and techniques in the West. Her debut English language cookbook, Food of Life, was hailed the definitive book of Iranian cooking by the LA Times. Her later books, Silk Road Cooking, was selected as one of the 10 best vegetarian cookbooks of 2004 by the New York Times, and her book, From Persia to Napa Wine. Wine at the Persian Table won the Gourmand Cookbook Award for Best Wine History Book of 2007. Her most recent cookbook, Cooking in Iran, Regional Recipes and Kitchen Secrets was selected as one of the best cookbooks of fall 2018 by the New York Times. Our guests will be in conversation with G. Daniela Galarza, a staff writer for the food section at the Washington Post. She's also the writer behind Eat Voraciously, a newsletter offering easy dinner recipes, cooking tips, and inspiration. A former restaurant pastry chef, Galarza has been writing about food and cooking for more than 10 years. And before joining the post, she was a, the features editor at Sears Eats, a senior editor at Eater.com and deputy food editor at Los Angeles Magazine. Her work has been, her work has appeared in the New York Times, New York Magazine, Wall Street Journal and other publications. And giving tonight's opening remarks will be Terrell Danley, AKA Chef T, the Associate Director of Education and Training for the Washington Literacy Center. Chef T's journey to the WLC was fueled by his passion for food and urban adult education. Karela served as instructor and curriculum developer for the organization's culinary job training program, where his success led to a promotion to program manager and general manager, allowing him to co-develop and implement an acclaimed workforce and readiness program at the Town Hall Education, Arts and Recreation Campus in Southeast Washington. Carol also served as the lead culinary arts instructor for the Potomac Job Corps Center and created the Job Corps' nationally top-ranked culinary arts program. So we've got a great roster of guests for you tonight. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Mayuk, Nashmia, Daniela, and Chef T to Politics and Pros Live. Have a great night. Well, before we actually get started, just like to say on behalf of the Washington Literacy Center and our partners at Politics and Pros, uh, we want to just thank you for joining us, the, joining us this evening to be part of this wonderful author series event. Please realize uh, that because of your continued support, 
36% of our Washington, D.C. neighbors are able to gain access to life-changing literacy, numeracy, and digital opportunities. So again, we just want to say thank you to you. Now with the official welcome and opening remarks uh, complete, I must confess that tonight's event is personally extremely in in inspiring to me. Uh, I was hoping that you wouldn't tell you guys that, that my moniker formerly was Chef T, but as a retired DC chef and restaurateur of more than 25 years, um, I'm not only familiar with Najmi, but 20 years ago, I actually had an opportunity to attend a cooking demonstration in your house in Georgetown. That's why before we start, I was asked if you're still in DC. And one of the things that I took with me throughout my entire career is how to actually cook rice. You taught us how to rinse it, and you taught us how to, how to then boil it, and then strain it, and then put it back in the pot and steam it to make a mound. But the one thing I've never been able to master is how to get that crunchy bottom. So I am so glad that you are joining us tonight. Again, thank you very much on behalf of Washington Literacy Center, and I so look forward to this evening. Thank you. Well, you should come back and, and learn how to make rolling cross study. <laughs> We should all be invited. <laughs> yeah, to your apartment. That'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> I love how we've just all invited ourselves to your house. Not I know. It feels like we're all sitting together as it is right now. I'm so excited. Thanks so much for having me. Um, for anyone who didn't hear, um, I just wanted to mention that Joe Yonan uh, was supposed to be hosting, but he was unfortunately very sick. He's had a flu for the past few days. And so I'm filling in for him. He's really sorry to miss it. Um, Joe's great. Obviously, Joe's a huge fan of everyone here too, and loves my loves my book, and obviously loves is a huge fan of Najme as well. Um, I think we should just dive in, start the conversation, huh? Um, my your book is incredible. Uh, Tastemakers: Seven Im Immigrant Women Who Revolutionized Food in America. It's unexpected and yet entirely necessary. Um, I've heard it described as sort of a group biography. It coalesces into this dissection of America's modern culinary history. And I really love the way you've interwoven a lot of themes that are appearing in food media today within this book. But maybe you could talk a little bit about how you decided on these seven women and how you decided to put them together. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, uh, Politics and Prose. Truly appreciate it. Thank you, Daniela, for joining, uh, you know, Najmi and myself in conversation tonight. And thank you for the very kind words about uh, my book. I don't think I deserve them at all, uh, but I'm very flattered. Uh, so I first had the idea for this book uh, back in 2017. Uh, and, you know, back then I was a 25 year old staff writer at a site called Food 52. And a lot of my uh, work at that site had uh, focused on figures who uh, belong to marginalized communities whom I felt uh, were not sufficiently honored uh, by American cultural memory in the way that uh, they should have been given their talents and their contributions. And a friend of mine said, oh, you know, I wonder if there is a larger project that exists that ties a lot of these stories together because so many of those stories focus on the contributions of immigrant women. And I put that in my back pocket and I really revisited it uh, in 2018 when I was uh, 26 years old. I was like, yeah, maybe it's time to, you know, uh, get to work on a book proposal. And uh, so I spent uh, 2018 just kind of putting this proposal together. And, you know, as someone who was kind of a young writer, I felt as though the uh, register that I was most comfortable in was kind of these uh, shorter biographical essays that were a few thousand words long, uh, you know, that would really allow me to, you know, to the best of my limited abilities as a storyteller, capture the fullness of someone's life and work and a legacy uh, with as much care and sensitivity as I felt they deserved. Uh, and so that was kind of the ethos that brought me uh, to this project. And I knew, you know, early on that I wanted to include a mix of uh, some figures who are no longer with us because those are the figures who are often the most susceptible to being forgotten by uh, American cultural memory. Uh, but I also wanted to include uh, living figures who were, uh, you know, had very, very strong, passionate fan bases, uh, yet, you know, uh, may not have, at least to my mind, uh, been uh, sufficiently uh, recognized for their contributions by the wider uh, American food media. And so I uh, had a few, uh, you know, living subjects in mind. And, but the way that Najmie came <laughs> into this project is a, a little different. Uh, she 
believe it or not, uh, in late 2018, just as I was putting the proposal for this book together, she had another cookbook coming out. And I was talking to Joe Yonan, uh, you know, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. And I was like, you know what? I didn't know that she had a cookbook. I've always wanted to profile her because she fascinates me as a figure who is so beloved by people both within the Iranian diaspora and outside of it. And I always wanted to know her story and the circumstances that brought her to America and brought her to cooking in America in particular, especially because I knew that all of her books had been self-published at that point. And so uh, her new book in uh, late 2018, uh, Cooking in Iran, uh, gave me an excuse to report on her for the Washington Post. And as I was uh, you know, so graciously welcomed um, into her home um, alongside her husband, uh, Muhammad. Uh, you know, I realized that I wanted to write more about Najme beyond this, uh, you know, small article that was going to be 1800 words long or something like that. And so I was working on my book proposal uh, concurrently and I thought, what a great opportunity to tell her story in a fuller way. And so that's how Najme came into the fray. And I'm so uh, fortunate that she trusted me with her story. You write about her life so beautifully in almost a cinematic way, I think. Um, and a lot of that can become too saccharine, like, you know, a little bit too sweet, but I really love how it feels so authentic and, and even pairs really well with Najmi's own books. Um, I want to switch a little bit over to Najmi since you mentioned the introduction, how you two were introduced. Um, and just talk about, I think a lot of people think that your first book, Najmi, was Food of Life, published in 1986, but it actually wasn't. Maybe you could talk about your first book publishing experience. Yes. Um, my first book actually was Ma Cuisine d'Iran in French. Uh, we, you know, we became refugee in, in France, sort of France, uh, then, uh, in 1979. I left Iran alone. Uh, then my husband joined me three months afterwards. And so uh, I was uh, alone. I didn't speak French. Um, I did not know anyone. And uh, I decided I was pregnant. So um, I uh, put an ad at the University of Nice. Then to find a tutor, then um, she helped me to find doctors. Find she helped me to learn French and to adjust myself because uh, sort of uh, being alone is was not very <laughs> helpful. So I then I when my husband came. We lived in a small village in south of France, and then um, I was pregnant. And uh, afterwards, I started writing love letter to my children, my future children, because I was pregnant, and because I want them to know all the good things that I have experienced. And I had this feeling they will never see wrong, and I was right. My oldest son is 41 years old and he loves to go to Iran. Um, he hasn't seen Iran and my youngest is 37. And so uh, I, I thought of, I was right. I want them to connect with their culture through, through my experience. So I was a medium. <laughs> so they connect with the only good experience I had when I was growing up in Iran. I want them to eat fresh hot barbary bread with queen's jam and butter at the top with the sweet tea in the morning. So I, I uh, sort of start writing about all these experiences and then I start cooking with my neighbor. I took some cooking classes in France. Then uh, my neighbor uh, suggested after I had 50 recipe, I should do a cookbook. So <laughs> It was a very challenging time because uh, I, French was my third language and I did not, I wasn't fluent with it in, in French language. So uh, it was quite challenging to write recipes. 
and uh, after a year or so, I had 50 recipes and all this experience about no rules, about from my childhood breakfast. And, and then my neighbor helped me to find a publisher. So my first cookbook was published in French, Ma Cuisine which I, uh, which I learned, you know, there was a Roger Verge was the neighbor in that area at that yeah. time. He was alive and he had uh, Cuisine de Soleil, which I learned, uh, you know, I sort of copy his, his title and I said, Ma Cuisine d'Iran. So he's, so he was Ma Cuisine de Soleil, that was his title, and my mind was Ma Cuisine d'Iran. So that was the story of my first cookbook in French. I, I love that connection to Verger and how, also I think Mayuki wrote about how um, Najmier saw the recipes in that book as, 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 having, as being a little bit more expansive than traditional French cuisine. And so that there was an entryway, there was an appetite in France in the 80s for other cuisines and for you know, expansiveness outside of that. I think we think of French cuisine and, and French cooks as being very rigid and only wanting to make French things. And so I think even in that early part, you found an audience. Um, but I also love the story about how you found the publisher and how that led you to becoming, you and Mohammed, your husband, becoming your own publishers and yeah. paving that path. Um, maybe you and my, you can talk a little bit, a little bit about that and the interesting sort of way you, you know, you took classes, you, you both sort of divvied up that work and how you mastered that when you came to the U.S. Are you, you, you start. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Got it. Well, <laughs> well, you know, um, it, back in France, you know, uh, so she met with, uh, I th believe it was Jacques Rancher, uh, I'm yeah. probably mispronouncing that, um, yeah. you know, uh, who's her publisher. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from my uh, recollection, at least, uh, that meeting obviously resulted in the book being published in the French language, yet, uh, you know, they forced uh, Najmi to shorten her surname uh, to Batman, <laughs> so, or Batman, I guess you could say, <laughs> uh, which uh, really speaks to, at least, uh, you know, from my perspective, uh, this uh, kind of belief that, uh, you know, writers from marginalized communities, like the one that uh, Najmi belongs to, uh, you know, had to make certain sacrifices and silence parts of themselves, maybe for commercial viability in this home. But uh, certainly, uh, you are exactly right that, uh, you know, in Najmi's experience, from my understanding, uh, France had gone through its gastronomic revolution, so to speak, long before America did. And as a result, uh, it did have this appetite uh, for the cuisines of the Middle and cooking styles of the Middle East in particular. Uh, but then, uh, you know, circumstances brought her to America in uh, 1983. And, uh, you know, I hope this is fair to say, Najmi, that uh, you felt as though France was not uh, the most hospitable place to raise two brown sons because they were, sure. you know, yeah, there were various forms of discrimination that they faced just as young kids even then. And so you came to D.C. and even when you came to America in 1983, you realized that there was this longer, more ambitious English language cookbook inside of you. And you really wanted to, uh, you know, make that dream a reality. And so you sent out all these query letters to different publishing houses, major publishing houses that, you know, had published uh, cookbooks on uh, cuisines from outside continental Europe, yet uh, you were met with either polite rejection or total silence. And the message kind of implicit there was that uh, the shadow of both the Iranian revolution in uh, 1979, along with the hostage crisis, they loomed so large that, you know, so many major American publishers uh, saw publishing an Iranian cookbook as just total anathema to them uh, and it wouldn't sell. And so as a result, what you and Muhammad did together you thought back to that man in France whom you had met <laughs> at Jean Croncher, and you said, you know what? We can do that too. We can be publishers ourselves. So you took the right classes, you, uh, you know, pooled enough capital to establish a publishing house of your own, and that resulted in the publication of your first English language uh, cookbook, uh, Food of Life, in the mid-1980s, which is now, uh, you know, this tome of Iranian cooking, uh, and it's an incredibly important text, but you've published all of your cookbooks 
uh, under, uh, you know, that publishing house that you and Muhammad established, which I, I, I find so inspiring. We lived next to Georgetown University when we decided to, to sort of start our own publishing house. I took a, the, the graphic design course, so I designed the cover of all the, all the books, and Mohammed took editing course. So the teachers at the university, at Georgetown University, was very helpful. Actually, I remember that he helped us to, for starting our publishing house. He gave us a lot of good ideas and encouragement. That was, that was the greatest thing. And I think uh, one of the reasons um, that uh, being outside of your country, you want to connect with your root. I think that was the main um, desire for me. I want to connect with my root. I want to identify myself through my culture. So this will be reducing uh, the pain of being away from my culture. I think if I was in Iran, perhaps I would write about uh, the French food. <laughs> but being away from your culture, you sort of you have this yearning, yearning and desire to connect with your root. I think that was the major uh, reason for me uh, to, to start writing about uh, food and, 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 and I wanted to connect. So I so think that's, that's no, I, I love that you mentioned that because it wasn't just, I mean, it, it was initially that, you know, you were wanting to make sure your sons had these, met, had, were able to experience these same things, or you were able to remember them so that you could tell them about these things that they might never experience. But that initial feeling started because you were not just an immigrant, but a refugee from a country that had completely changed. And when you first landed in France, you didn't have, there weren't any other Iranians there. And, and I think that was part of the reason why you ended up settling in DC, that there were people from all different cultures you saw, and maybe there was, you know, you found it easier to connect with other Iranians that had come to the United States. Um, I wanted to ask about when you did publish the book, how you connected with some of those people who ended up helping spread the word of mouth of the book. You talked to my, my first cookbook. Yes, Food, Food of Life. Life. Food of Life at Yes <laughs> Class. And especially at a time, this is well before the internet, well before, uh, you know, you didn't have a PR person. You didn't yes, have, yeah. you know, <laughs> a mailing list. So how did you, yeah, how did you do it? Yes, oh, I remember Muhammad and I, we opened up the uh, yellow book. And white then page. The white pages, <laughs> yes. And then we... Uh, we just guess what who are the Iranians, the names of Iranian. So we collect. It took us a few weeks. To, we we collect about thousands of names, and <clears throat> and then we made the uh, brochure of all uh, this, which designed by me and uh, uh, and Mohammed. We came up uh, uh, this beautiful brochure with nice photo of the, the, of the book, uh, which, you know, my photographer in France came and stayed with us and he did my first work in English. Same photographer was in France. You know, when I lived in France, of France, there was one photographer in, the, in that village, one library and one cinema. So that the only photography, and he became our friends. And for my first cookbook with my cousin Iran, we took a lot of beautiful pictures. And at that time, I learned I am a good stylist. I didn't know that things were in, was within me. So he said, I don't want to do any stylist. You just tell me where do you want to, uh, uh, <laughs> where, what you want to take a picture. I'll do that. I know about lighting but I don't want to do any display. And it gave me sort of a freedom to express the way I wanted to project Persian culture. I didn't want to be an Orientalist. I didn't want to be from the eye of foreigner. I want to be from the eye of Persian, how they want to project the food and, and, and of course, cultures. Um, so, uh, when we came to uh, 
in the US. He, we invited him he took the pictures of the books, of all the recipes I had in the kitchen. And we include that in the brochure. And we send out the brochure. And to our surprise, uh, we got a 30%, was it 30%? 30 percent instead of 3%. 30% <laughs> of this. We were so encouraged and happy. So that was our first experience of selling the cookbook via mail. That was, that, that was as you said, before internet, there were all kinds of things. So that was encouragement. And uh, it, that, that really helped me, uh, sort of encouraged me that uh, to do more research. I uh, look into Persian cookbooks from 10th century, which is written in Arab, Arabic, because Iran, um, per, the, during the Sasanian 3rd century, uh, the Second Persian Empire, they were foodies. First Persian Empire, 500 BC, they were foodies. We have a lot of reference and documents. And then when uh, Arab came to Iran, Islam came to Iran in the seventh century, they adopt Persian way and Persian food. <laughs> and, then, and then they uh, sort of uh, forced Iranian to write <laughs> the, the cookbooks, but they had to write in. Arabic. Well, but, uh, when I examine all these recipes, I realize these are all Iranian <laughs> dishes. That, and then I look into 16th century Persian cookbook. I look in the 15th century cookbook. Was Hakwa At Ame? He is the he was a poet, also gastronomer, and he wrote the whole divan, whole collection uh, uh, of uh, poetry but all about Persian food. That I learned that we had so many dishes that uh, contemporary Persian culture doesn't have it. So then we came to uh, Rajar's period, which they became in the 19th century, they became very elaborated and, uh, and sophisticated, create a lot of uh, pastry, very sophisticated pastry. We have a lot of reference of it. So, and then I look into Persian miniature. I see a lot of scenes <laughs> roasting ducks, <laughs> making dumpling. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, then I went to museum, Sackler Museum. They had a lot of utensils, a lot of objects of, with, on clay pots, on, uh, uh, clay pots, uh, iron pots. Uh, the, and they, then I realized that Persian cooking, which goes back to uh, uh, three, 4,000 years ago, I realized that Persian food was very sophisticated. Uh, I, I can tell after all this research, Persian food is one of the oldest and the most sophisticated cooking um, school that, uh, uh, which is at least, unfortunately, least known in the West. And I'm sure with the help of Mayu <laughs> and my books, so we can have, we hopefully we'll have more, 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 more people who know about it and wanted to cook Persian food. That speaks to something that, um, you know, I think my you, you touched on in the book a lot, the, the struggle between these, these seven women wanting to assimilate into American culture, but also wanting to stay true to their, to their heritage and not take too many shortcuts in recipes. I think that's something, Najmi, that's something why your early audience was a lot of Iranians or other Iranian refugees or immigrants because your recipes were true to the, to the traditions and the cuisine and you didn't take any shortcuts. Did you think about that decision when you were writing the book? Did you? No, I, was, yeah. My first question was my mother's recipes. My first cook was my mother's recipes, uh, which I tested and I asked uh, Georgetown students come as my inter. Uh, they test the recipe, which was lovely because they were American and, and they had no idea that what would be the result. And, 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 and so it was, uh, it was sort of, it happened organically uh, when I wrote my first cookbook. And what I wanted to share a, a, a true, as you said, 
through recipes, my experience, my mother recipe. But for later on, when I revised the Food of Life, uh, I did a lot of research. I realized that Persian food is not just, just a hundred recipe of my mother. I realized that there are a lot of forgotten uh, recipes, a lot of lost recipes, which I rediscovered them and I included in, the, in this book. So, uh, uh, and these are also through recipes. I think uh, when you're an immigrant um, and when you want to, to uh, present your culture, your roots, I think you should be true or you should be true with yourself too uh, because you have a sort of mission and you have a responsibility to present that culture uh, in its, uh, uh, what, how do I say, Muhammad? I want to say that the, you have a responsibility to delay the message uh, in, in, in true uh, uh, forms. So, uh, I mean, I wanted to present it uh, uh, as what it is rather than. Uh, my you have to help me now. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, rather than a modified version. You know, <laughs> oh, I, I understand what you're saying, but go on, Mike. Yeah, yes. I, I was just going to say, I'm reminded of, uh, you know, this one line that you gave me as I was reporting this chapter, which is that you had come across uh, one Iranian uh, cookbook that had been published prior to Food of Life in America uh, that used soy sauce as an ingredient, which it struck you as just uh, kind of sacrilegious, you know, uh, in the Persian cooking that was familiar to you. And you wanted to make sure that you were not uh, making those sorts of uh, shortcuts just for commercial viability. And I think that that speaks to so much of what inspires me about Najmi's story, and it's just why I was so uh, passionate of, about uh, devoting a chapter to her in this book, which is that so many of the stories of the women um, whom I focus on in this book, you know, are ones where they felt as though assimilating was the only path to success because that was just the reality for them and the challenges that they faced in uh, that era in America in which immigrants, uh, you know, to be able to make a living and really survive in America, uh, you know, they had to uh, make those compromises, uh, you know, to reach a wide audience. Yet Najmi took a completely different path in that she was not writing for, you know, uh, the oriental gaze, as she said earlier. She was not necessarily writing just with her, uh, the white audience in mind, uh, you know, when she began writing about Iranian food uh, in I America. I was writing it for my community. That's very exactly. true. Exactly. Yes. She, she was writing for her own them. people. She was writing for her sons and, you know, all That's the other right. sons and daughters of Iran who had been displaced as a result of political realities. And she found an audience through that. And it just so happened that, you know, uh, because of a confluence of different factors, her audience uh, widened beyond the Iranian diaspora. And there are people like me who do not belong to that community, who know she is and appreciate her legacy a lot. But that was not her intention initially. And she found so much fulfillment and love in just creating for her own people. And I don't see that narrative too often in the American food media, this idea that you can find fulfillment uh, in creating for your own people. And yet you see it in Najmiya's story. So. So, and then identity is sort of defined through cultures, through food, music, as an immigrant, uh, rather than geographic location. You know, if you identify yourself through your food, your music, your language, there's less pain there as an immigrant when you're away from your, your culture. Uh, and, and, and that was very important for me. I wanted to, you know, I took uh, Haji Firuz, which is uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the singer and dancer, uh, Ram Nowruz. He was a red outfit and announced the arrival of the New Year. Uh, I took it to school during the Nowruz. So I wanted to present uh, the, that fun aspect of the Persian culture. I remember there were a few Iranian mother was there. They were very upset. They said, why you wanted to say you're Iranian? Mm -hmm. And they, they said, no, you should assimilate and just don't talk about being from Iran. I said, 
I, I, this is the way I want my children to be proud of, of their heritage. I want them to be proud of who they are. If they don't accept their mother tongue and their, their heritage, then they, they feel uh, not so confidence, you know, lack of confidence because you don't know who you are and that will not help helpful for any immigrant. They should know about their heritage and their culture and, and they define themselves through that rather than to, especially when you're away from your culture. So this, this really uh, help you to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to feel confidence in, in accept, your, accept yourself who you are. That's such a critical, critical message. And I think, my, I mean, I think you, I've heard you on interviews talk a little bit about this. I don't want to speak for you, but I, I think we do feel similarly that that um, American, you know, I'm a, child, I'm a child of immigrants and, and you're a child of immigrants. I think we have felt that this culture does impose upon you this idea that you have to assimilate in order to achieve success, that you have to um, check off a number of boxes you know, win these certain awards, be written up in these certain, um, you know, generally white dominated legacy publications. Um, I'm going to include my own, the Washington Post in that as well, you know, and, and, and you can achieve those things. But like Najme said, you can do those, but at the, you know, if you're doing them at the expense of yourself, you can end up feeling lost. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if, you had thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I definitely have thoughts and I don't want to, uh, you know, talk over Najmi. So uh, Najmi, if you have something to say, please do it. But, um, you know, I was just going to say that, you know, when I look back on just the five years that I've spent uh, as a so-called food writer or whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think that someone could probably look at my uh, CV or list of achievements or whatnot and think that, you know, I was someone who was uh, pursuing assimilation uh, in the sense that, you know, I came to this industry feeling very alone and to mitigate that sense of isolation and almost fraudulence, you know, I attacked all my work with the sense that I needed to prove myself and to prove myself to whom, you know, that, that whom was this white food establishment. And so I, you know, chased a certain uh, recognition from awards bodies and anthologies and whatnot. And it was really wonderful that, you know, I got some of that early in my career because what it did in practical terms is it opened up access to capital and opportunity that otherwise would not be available to me just because of who I am, how I look, you know, the fact that I'm a brown child of immigrants, you know, uh, and I don't have the advantages that a lot of my colleagues do in the industry right now. Yet, you know, especially as I was writing this book, I realized that having those uh, achievements, let's say, to my name did not necessarily fulfill me in creative terms. And what did fulfill me is writing, creating for my own people and making sure that whenever I wrote a sentence, you know, I was not betraying uh, people within my own community or people who belong to the communities that these women uh, in the book did, you know, and it's, it's definitely a challenge to, you know, as you write, make sure that you are speaking to that segment of the audience while also bringing others in who might uh, be a little curious. Uh, so that was, uh, <laughs> you know, a fun hurdle to try and overcome when writing this book. But uh, I think that reporting on Najmi's uh, story definitely clarified a lot for me in terms of how I want the rest of my career to shake out because she's a model to me for how to do it right. Oh, you, you, write, you, you write like poetry. You write so beautifully and, and for every woman. Uh, I've been listening to your book all day because I do, uh, I listen to books. I enjoy it, especially when I, I was putting a Nune Sangak today all day and I listened to your book. You know, I, uh, you, you write so beautifully. My, my congratulations all the way to you. <laughs> you. Absolutely. And, uh, you're so kind and I uh, decided to adopt you as my third son. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for welcoming me. I, yeah. I, I have two gay sons. You're going to be my third case. So. I'll be the third one. <laughs> I would love that. I think my mother's in the audience. So, uh, you know, oh. you, can, you can share me. Uh, and I don't have a father currently um, on this 
on this plane. So Muhammad, well, thank you for Muhammad is, me. Gonna, Muhammad is being proud of you so much. He's going to be proud <laughs> to be your father as well too, darling. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Could make me cry. <laughs> I, I feel like we could talk about food media all day, but I feel like we have this, you know, and everyone should be welcome to ask any questions in the chat. I don't think we have any questions yet, um, but so please drop them in if you have any. Oh, I see one for just someone saying Tadiq rocks. Tadiq does rock. We're going to talk about Tadiq a little bit later. Um, I want to just say that there are, um, oh, I guess there are questions. Oh, I do see questions. Okay, great. Yeah, Let's take, I, I apologize. I was looking in the wrong window, everyone. Thank you so much for asking questions. Um, I'm going to start with Lisa Amand asks, curious how Mayuk explores New York City neighborhoods and the hope of discovering ethnic restaurants and talented chefs who are unsung heroes. Oh, yeah, you know, I have, I have to say that, uh, you know, I haven't been uh, doing that as much uh, during the pandemic, unfortunately, you know, uh, kind of uh, going beyond my na my neighborhood, uh, especially because of uh, certain restrictions that were in place uh, last year, especially. Uh, that said, I think one uh, tool that has been really helpful for me in terms of making sure that certain talents are on my radar are uh, is social media as a kind of mundane as that sounds, you know, that is... If social media is good for one thing, it is, uh, you know, amplifying uh, certain voices and talents from uh, marginalized communities who may otherwise uh, not get the attention that they deserve from uh, establishment food publications. And, you know, just through discovering uh, certain chefs on Instagram, for example, and being in community with, uh, you know, some folks who belong to marginalized communities who are also, you know, cooking for a living, whether they're doing pop-ups or working in restaurants and so on, I've been able to discover a great number of chefs who uh, deserve wider attention. So that's unfortunately the only answer I've got to your question. You know, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, once uh, New York City opens all the way back up, you know, I can uh, go uh, exploring on the subway a little more and uh, find different people as well. You, I will say too, though, that you mention a lot of contemporary um, cooks in the book as well. So the book is is not just a resource for the history, but it you you touch on a lot of contemporary chefs and and food writers. Um, yeah. So that so yeah, go for the go for the great writing. Stay for the yeah. tips on on where to eat now, who's food to eat now. Directly. Um, <laughs> a question for um, Najmi: Do you think people who are more open minded also have more complex food palates? open-minded. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I, I noticed the one thing, intelligent people, they love to eat or they love to cook. There is a direct <laughs> relationship between intelligent and food. They, uh, so that's one of one, <laughs> one thing. I, I think um, uh, people love uh, good food in any culture. They love simple food. They love food they have. That's why I love Persian food because you keep the integrity of the ingredients. Seasonal, it's simple, and most important, eat with your friends and family. I think this, this is our very important element that, that uh, make your uh, meal pleasurable and enjoyable. <laughs> Definitely. I mean, uh, and, and so there's a, a fault, I guess, I would call this a follow-up question. It might be from a different um, viewer, but how has the pandemic changed your cooking or your relationship to cooking? Because as you said, something that's key in, in Iranian cuisine, especially, but many cuisines around the world is to eat as a family, to eat as a group. And the pandemic has kept us so far apart. Um, how, how, how has it changed your cooking? Uh, well, I, I stopped retesting <clears throat> the cooking in Iran from the beginning. I started, I thought that I need a project. So last two years, uh -huh. I've been testing, retesting, because I'm going to put cooking Iran on bed. So I am going to, uh, I started and I finished it last week. I'm very happy. Uh -huh. um, made some correction. I had more photos and um, some people, a lot of people asked me questions. I answered the questions. Uh, so I've been, very busy cooking in my kitchen and testing recipe. 
and um, I'm, and I was a very uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have a, a wonderful husband, which during the pandemic we didn't end up divorcing. We realized <laughs> because a lot of uh, couples during pandemic <laughs> they couldn't stand each other. So my in my case, God, uh, I'm very blessed. I realize it. I love my husband more than ever. So I share a lot of meal with him. I can we cook together. He became my sous chef for last two years, and then he, I know I, I set up the recipe. I mise en place everything. We cook together, and I test the recipe, and then uh, revise some of them. So uh, he included in the in the. Sister. Yeah, and then I have a sister, <clears throat> sisters nearby. I cook for them and I send it to them because we didn't, during that pandemic, we didn't want to see each other also. So, but I cooked, I had a mission cook to give it away to my older sisters. And, and they, yeah, I have a younger sister. She, she has an MS, she couldn't move around so much. So that was my... Uh, that was my uh, goal or my mission uh, for the last two years. I, you know, I you and then you uh, start uh, this during this pandemic. You start uh, thinking about how fortunate you are when you spend time with a friend. You appreciate more uh, how it's lovely to go to the movie, not just stay home. And the pandemic was had a very bad sides, but that made us to appreciate a lot of things that we took it for granted. Yeah, I can, I can also answer that if we do have time. Yeah. It's just yeah. that, you know, I, I kind of like I hinted at earlier, I'm not much of a cook, you know, I'm more interested in the people who make food like Najme, mm -hmm. uh, rather than uh, food, the object itself. Uh, and so as a result, you know, I was not uh, necessarily an avid home cook. And I think that uh, is mostly still true. Uh, these days I live alone and I have to, you know, make uh, food for myself. But I, I realized that through the pandemic, I am uh, being more responsible about feeding myself. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I was a uh, really fortunate to spend uh, a few months last year uh, during 2020 with my mother uh, who lives in an apartment in uh, New Jersey and uh, she is my best friend. And uh, through just, you know, having the great, great luxury of eating so much of her cooking on an almost daily basis, there were like a few times when I cooked and it was mostly disastrous, of course. So I'm sorry, mom, you know, um, but you know, in just um, having that sort of uh, expression of love daily, it reminded me so much of just her artistry and, you know, someone asked me uh, a few <laughs> just before this, you know, who was the woman who revolutionized food for you? And my answer was my mother, because growing up, she had so much humility about her absolutely tremendous cooking. And I was so close to her that I absorbed a lot of that humility in the sense that I didn't realize what was so spectacular about what she made at home and get being a food writer, writing this book, especially, and then spending time with her last year really made me realize just how incredibly like that's labor for her cooking yet yeah, there's a lot of love in there too and it is a form of creative creative expression at least from my perspective and so i'm glad that you know the confluence of all those factors writing this book the pandemic and kind of a you know it forcing me to spend time with her uh, really made me understand that on a deeper level and you know that in persian culture as well as i think indian and Chinese, and, and I, I know about, uh, I think cooking for someone, uh, it's, it's of course sort of is a silent language. You tell that person, I love you. And I think that was your mom's food, just transfer a lot of love to her uh, cooking to you. You know, we, as a, a, a mother, we sometimes we don't know how to express our love to our children. I think by cooking for them, that's that's the best way we we transfer this love and and then with the silent language, we tell them how how much we love them. So I think that's 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 the best way your mother talked to you. Totally, yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you. 
love this question. Um, what have you learned from each other related to your generational differences? Oh, wow. Um, I can, I can uh, take this first. Uh, so I'm sure that Najme has a much more articulate and interesting mm -hmm. answer, uh, but it was kind of what I was saying earlier, which is that, uh, you know, early in my career as a food writer, I was really chasing that kind of recognition and uh, it was uh, born out of a sense of pragmatism and also um, a sense of inadequacy that I wanted to stave off uh, through my work. Yet I realized that it is far more fulfilling in the long term to find your community if you haven't already and making sure that you are reaching them through your creative work. And when I look at Najmi's career, she is someone who has done exactly that. And look, she's a legend now. And that was her intention from the very start. And I only wish that I had begun my uh, you know, little career as a food writer five years ago with that same uh, kind of clarity of uh, intent and thoughts, uh, because it is quite uh, inspiring to me. So that's just uh, a little bit about what she's taught me, but she's taught me so many other things, uh, including, uh, you know, some cooking things as well. But <laughs> uh, You know, um, when my son read uh, my youth's article about me, and they both, uh, they love his writing. And he they told me, mom, he knows you. So I realize it. If you're a sensitive uh, intellectual, perhaps more sensitive person, uh, you can uh, relate, and you can uh, understand people, even though we didn't spend so much time with it. But my youth understood me. And that was lovely. I learned that, that uh, if you're opening your heart, you can relate to people and you can understand people um, more, than, more than ever. I think I learned that a lot of things, bad things happen in this world because of misunderstanding or lack of understanding. So my, I learned from my youth that uh, you should open your heart. Of course, you should be talented like my youth too. <laughs> Otherwise you cannot write so well. <laughs> So that was my, my understanding, my, uh, my take from my youth. Thank you so much for saying that. Beautiful. Although I feel like we're setting up readers for disappointment and that they're going to see this book and be like, <laughs> they talk this guy up so much. And <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I apologize in advance to audience. The way you write about uh, Julia Child, I think I know I knew a lot about Julia Child. And, uh, but the way you present different dimension of Julia Child about Julia Child. It was so beautiful. I think you're a great writer and I'm so happy and honored to be part of this book. Well, it was a no-brainer, so thank you very much. And we won't bore the audience anymore with this stuff, sorry. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. <laughs> I wanna, yeah, no, someone is asking, and this is a question for, um, for my youth probably, are there any Japanese or African immigrant women cooks who were almost featured in the book? Yes, there were quite a few. Uh, in terms of Japanese, uh, Hiroko Shimbo was uh, one I had on my radar. Uh, she was um, an author who worked with uh, the famed uh, Knopf editor, uh, Judith Jones. Uh, she was one of uh, her, uh, Judith Jones's many uh, really, really talented uh, authors. And I had had the great fortune of writing about Hiroko Shimbo uh, when I was at Food 52. And, you know, that was just some small article. I really wanted a reason to, uh, you know, write about her at greater length. Yet, unfortunately, just circumstances did not allow me to do so. But I do hope that, you know, uh, future writers who write a much better version of this book, you know, will focus on her story uh, because it is quite fascinating and rich and inspiring. And if, if you are not familiar with Hiroko Shimbo's uh, work and her books in particular, they're really, really uh, magnificent. Uh, in terms of African chefs, yes, absolutely. And one I was particularly, uh, you know, heartbroken to kind of part ways with as I write in the afterword for my uh, book is uh, the story of the Eritrean-born uh, chef, Desta Bayru, and it's actually funny that this uh, comes up now because she was the chef of uh, Washington, D.C.'s first known Ethiopian restaurant called Mama Desta uh, in the late 1970s. And I think that 
her cooking, you know, is so responsible today for just, you know, this marvelous landscape that uh, so many Americans inhabit where, you know, Ethiopian restaurants are a vital part of uh, DC uh, and its culinary landscape, along with uh, so many other uh, major metropolitan uh, areas in America. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I ran into so many roadblocks. The Death of Iris is no longer alive. And when I was writing these posthumous um, chapters, you could say, I really needed to find uh, materials that presented these women speaking in their own voice in some way, whether that was through memoirs or cookbooks with memoiristic passages or a wealth of interviews they'd given. And unfortunately, that material just did not exist for someone like Desta. And so uh, it's really sad uh, to that I, uh, you know, could not write uh, a really fleshed out chapter on her and include her in this book, yet I felt as though I'd be doing a disservice to her legacy if I tried to shoehorn uh, her story uh, into this uh, larger book. And I think that, you know, a much more talented agile writer, like, uh, you know, unlike myself, uh, will hopefully uh, <laughs> devote at least one chapter, if not an entire book uh, to her uh, in a future text. Or maybe you'll write uh, another book. We'll see. <laughs> Tastemakers too. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, so we only have time for two more questions. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, let's see. Mayuk, do you have access to the question and answers too? Yes, are you, I do. Yeah. There are some that are maybe specific to you, but let me just ask. I'm going to ask one more for you, but you might. there are some you might want to answer if you have time. And then I'm going to ask um, the last one to Najmi. Um, so Mayuk, growing up, were there any queer of color writers that influence the way you think? Oh, oh man, that is a great question. Oh my goodness. Uh, queer POC writers in particular. Growing up, you know, I am sad to say that uh, there weren't many, um, you know, whom whose work I uh, really responded to uh, growing up. Now that's uh, not the case, of course. There's so many talented uh, queer POC writers, both within the food space and outside of it, uh, whom I uh, turn to quite often, but I think that just speaks to, uh, you know, the work that I've been doing over the past few years in the sense that, you know, I was uh, operating, you know, my mind was operating as a writer, uh, you know, under whiteness and its constraints, you know, uh, because I associated uh, greatness uh, with these white institutions, white writers and so on and so forth. And so I think one of the great virtues of being able to uh, do a project like this was to actually expand my, <laughs> you know, my uh, reading and uh, make sure that I was, uh, you know, uh, unworking or uh, unlearning, let's say, you know, um, all of that sort of conditioning that had led my early life as a writer. And I do hope that, that comes through in the book itself. Absolutely. Um, I think we'll, let's, let's end on a, on a timely topic. Najmie, um, People are asking a little bit about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is coming up next next week. I've been to some Iranian Thanksgiving celebrations. They're enormous. It's usually the traditional Thanksgiving foods and then also all kinds of Iranian stews as well. Do you have any any tips for people on, on Iranian foods they could make that would go with the Thanksgiving meal? Yes. You know, when I was growing up, uh, my mother used to make the whole turkey, cooked the whole turkey in pomegranate juice mm -hmm. then for, for one hour. Then she, she drained them and then she roast them. So it was crispy, uh, sour, spicy, uh, very flavorful. And then she made uh, fesenjun, which is walnut pomegranate sauce. Uh, then she added that roasted turkey inside it. That's become a wonderful dish. And then it's good also to serve this with sweet rice, carrots, candied orange peel rice is great mm. with it. And then you serve with a bowl of pomegranate seeds. And of course, green salad or kale or whatever green you want. Uh, and then with it. So that's the... And in food, in food of life, I have a recipe of that too. Also, you can uh, you can look at it. So the whole turkey cooked in pomegranate juice in the that Sounds so good. Yes. Maybe, maybe I'll make my mom make it. So <laughs> <laughs> this was so fun. Thank you so much for for letting me uh, talk to you both tonight. It was really an honor. Mayu, congratulations on the book. 
Najme, it's so lovely to talk to you. I hope everyone has at least one of your books in their library. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniela. You're a marvelous moderator. Yes, Daniela, you, you know, you blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so proud of you, especially you're half Persian. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, biased. <laughs> Uh, and unfortunately, I will have to cut in here and do the closing remarks. But thank you. This was such a heartwarming talk. Like it's it's just so wonderful to hear such good stories and in time for Thanksgiving. And like it's a it's a great it, it was a great night. <laughs> but this is a bookstore, so I do have to ask everyone. So what are you guys currently reading? What would you guys like to suggest to our readers? And um, yeah, what's on your nightstand right now? Oh, Jesus. Okay, hold on. Let me look at my bookshelf. Someone else take this question first. Because I've been kind of like cycling through different books. Lately. I'm I'm looking at my nightstand right now, and I do have Susan Choi is my education over there. But I want to shout out um, "Open Veins of Latin America" by Eduardo Calano. I love this excellent. Book. It is an excellent book. I do really like that one. I was just gonna say uh, Orwell's Roses, uh, which just recently came out. It's by Rebecca Selnitz, you know, she's a writer uh, who really yeah. inspires me. And that is such uh, in a kind of um, unconventional uh, biographical form that she's working in uh, through this book. And I love just kind of focusing on one aspect of uh, a figure who is otherwise known to so many readers. Uh, so that's been giving me a lot of inspiration. Or well, awesome. yeah. yes, I have been really looking forward to that one. There's just so many books in the world. There are. It's fall. Yeah. <laughs> Not really. What's on your bookshelf? I I suggest you listen to Mayur's book. <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely, especially this woman. She she really reads well. She, she brings She's, another dimension. That's my suggestion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The actress who listen to her is amazing. <laughs> Uh, she, <laughs> she makes my words much sound much better than they actually are. So please listen to the book. Don't read it. Yes, <laughs> Thank yes, you all so much. But yes. it is a gorgeous book and it is the holiday season. And I would imagine there's so many people who would love this in their stocking or under their tree. It's gorgeous and oh God, I can't rave about it enough. But everyone, thank you. Thank you, friends. Thank you for graciously and generously sharing your wisdom, your insight, your stories, your warmth, your table. It has been such an illuminating evening. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here. And I, I, I think the audience has been just like graced by all of your words tonight. And thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, your patronage is what enables us to bring you such beautiful events like this. And we cannot continue to host these without the, these events without the book sales to support them. So please support um, our amazing author and politics and prose by using the link in the chat to purchase Tastemakers on our website. It came out this Tuesday and it is beautiful, guys. Um, also, you can also find on our website the most current updated event listings and we have a great list of events to choose from. And to all of our members who are here, um, it is our member sale this weekend. So if you have any, so if you guys were looking to purchase the book, it's gonna be 20% off of your member. And all of that said, um, stay strong, stay safe, and stay well read. And thank you again to our guests. Thank you for your time and have a good night, everyone.